You know how I said you were a failure and a quitter? I forgot one more thing. You're also a loser. Make way for the loser. Coming through. Here she is. Failure slash quitter slash loser. The triple threat. <laughs> there she goes. <laughs> Real original title, Chris. Yes, I'm aware this form of title has been used before, but it's apt. It perfectly describes how I feel. And I couldn't call it why disenchantment left me disenchanted, because I was never enchanted in the first place. Disenchantment is an animated comedy series on Netflix, and the latest creation of Matt Groening. For all three of you who aren't aware, he's the guy responsible for The Simpsons and Futurama, two of the most popular and iconic animated shows ever made. So, of course, hopes were high. Set in the fantasy kingdom of Dreamland, the show follows the rebellious Princess Bean and her friends as they cause trouble, get up to various escapades, and spend a lot of time getting wasted. It sets out to offer a subversive parody of the fantasy genre and a more mature form of comedy than any of Groening's previous creations. Sounds good, right? Well, no, it isn't. In fact, I found it a massive disappointment. That's not to say that I didn't like anything about it, but I'm going to be focusing on the negatives here, because that's what I do. Before we go any further, I know that humour is subjective, and if you did enjoy Disenchantment and found it the most hilarious thing since Katie Hopkins' bankruptcy, then all power to you. But I didn't. I'm going to offer what I believe are some objective reasons for why I think Disenchantment is a disappointment, beyond my not finding it funny. But of course, a lot of this is just my opinion. I've seen some people saying that Disenchantment shouldn't be compared to The Simpsons and Futurama, if for no other reason than that it will always come up short due to the power of nostalgia. But even if it were assessed purely on its own merits, it would still be found lacking. But I think it's both unavoidable and perfectly fair to compare it to Groening's other work, because not only can it be taken as a reflection of his talents, but Netflix used his name and reputation to market the show, without which it would have received far less attention if it were made at all, so it's not getting a pass there. Having said that, I'm not an expert on either The Simpsons or Futurama, so for that reason I've avoided making comparisons between every aspect of the shows. But based on the experience I do have, the already lacklustre quality and entertainment value of Disenchantment was made worse by knowing the superior quality of what came before. It's kinda like the Godfather series. The first two were great, the third one was… meh. That's Disenchantment, a 10 hour long meh and here's why. Let's start with the design and some other technical features of the show. It wastes no time at all waving its mediocrity in your face with its opening sequences, which are just a series of stylized images taken from some of the locations to be featured in that particular episode. They offer small hints of what's to come, but nothing that would make you look forward to it. Compare this with The Simpsons. Not only does its intro tell you something about each of its main characters, but each episode features a unique chalkboard and couch gag, some of which are very clever and creative. The writers had to actually put some effort into them, and I never got bored of watching them. But this? This is just a slideshow. It's bland, uninspired, and lazy. Thankfully, they're shorter than most of my first dates, but it sets a terrible first impression. The animation style is nice, but that's the most you can say about it, aside from some CGI transitions and drug-induced hallucinations, which do stand out. It doesn't stray away from the formula you'd expect from Groening, and it never blew me away. Quite the opposite, sometimes it looked too simplistic, like they weren't putting in any effort. The music is fine, but during scenes that are full of action or meant to be tense, it's far too quiet. <laughs> This has the effect of sapping away much of the excitement, which is the exact opposite of what a soundtrack is meant to do. As a quick aside, one thing I did appreciate was the voice acting, which for the most part is more than adequate, and Matt Berry's voice makes me harder than Dark Souls 3. No worry, I am an expert hunter, and I will track down the woman I love. Keep the champagne chilled, I shall return before the last uncle passes out. Oh yes, daddy, take me now. Tighter, man, tighter! I have poor impulse control.
This enchantment story begins by stretching out over its first two episodes. Then the next five episodes are more or less self-contained, with only a thin plot thread connecting them with the first and last episodes. The story picks up again in the last three episodes, which are by far the best, both objectively and when compared with the previous episodes. There's plenty of twists and turns and revelations towards the end, and it genuinely surprised me by permanently killing off one of its main characters, and having another character choose to revive someone else instead of them. I mean, holy shit, I was not expecting that. And you probably won't either. Major kudos to the writers for having the balls to do that. And from the way that Season 1 ended, it's clear that Season 2 will go in a very different direction. There's nothing wrong with a series ending on a high note, and in fact you'd expect it to, but the difference in writing quality between the last few episodes and the rest is so noticeable that I almost felt like I was watching a different show entirely. If the entire season had been as good as its last three episodes, I wouldn't have made this video, but here we are. I found the combination of the continuous story at either end with the self-contained episodes in the middle to be quite jarring. It's like the writers either couldn't decide which approach they wanted to take, or they couldn't think of a way to tell the story over 10 episodes without stretching it out thinner than a student's budget and padding it out more than a high schooler's bra. That's what half the season is. Padding. Breaking Bad also had this problem, but its padding was at least interesting, and Disenchantment is less than a quarter of the length of a season of Breaking Bad, so I don't see why they couldn't have found a way around this. They should have doubled down and either told one long story or had ten independent episodes with only some continuity between them, like The Simpsons and Futurama. At the moment it feels confused and honestly a bit lazy. Are you noticing a common theme yet? There also isn't a great deal of character development across the series. Princess Bean naturally receives the most, but most of the characters stay roughly as they are when they were first introduced, especially the side characters. I feel that they could have done more, but given that they only had five hours of episodes to work with, it's completely understandable. Hopefully this will be remedied in future seasons. Lastly, Disenchantment makes a pretense of subverting traditional fantasy tropes and cliches, and sometimes it does this well, but it's not as subversive and original as it thinks it is. For example, Princess Bean starts off by trying to get out of an arranged marriage. There's a plotline we haven't heard before. I can't help but feel that the show is about five years too late to be truly original. Much like my channel. <laughs> oh, I made myself sad. Disenchantment is meant to appeal to an older audience, its jokes and themes being more in tune with other adult-centred comedies, but it goes about marking itself out as an adult animation in the most half-assed way possible, throwing in lots of drinking, drugs and sex. Now there's nothing wrong with that, I do love me a good dick joke. And a good dick. But Disenchantment's problem is that it relies solely on its drinking, drugs and sex to separate itself from the kiddies. If you took those out, it would just be like Futurama. Having characters getting drunk, high and laid, or failing at getting laid, doesn't make a comedy mature, except in the sense of excluding kids from the joke and motivating a censor to slap on a harsher rating. Unlike Bojack Horseman, or even The Simpsons come to think of it, it does very little to address truly mature themes that adults would find relatable. It comes very close to doing so, through Bean's attempts to come of age and her love-hate relationship with her father. But that's about it. Instead, it gives her a drinking problem and then makes that her defining feature throughout most of the season. Disenchantment isn't adult, it's juvenile, and it feels like it wasted its potential to do more. Which brings us on to the area in which the show is most lacking. The one feature above all that the show needed to nail, but didn't. Disenchantment is a comedy, and if it had been a great comedy, none of the problems I've talked about would have mattered. But the humour is the show's biggest letdown. I was watching TV with my dad when the trailer came on, and honestly, with no exaggeration, I thought it was the unfunniest comedy trailer I'd seen since that for the Ghostbusters remake. When it was over, my dad actually turned to me and asked, Son? What the fuck was that? So I had very low expectations. But in fairness, the show wasn't as bad as the trailer. In fact, I did like some of the jokes, especially the ones that relied on a sudden, sharp shock. Now that the single trap has been triggered, I'm sure the cave is safe to enter. Allow me. There's also some good use of dark humor. You're so kind, but you have a hidden rage inside you that no one else can see. 
It's why I can't keep a dog alive. Which I personally love. Especially when there's a contrast between the bright and happy setting and the dark and twisted events that are occurring. And some of the jokes are kind of clever. The monotony, the repetition, the monotony, the repetition, the monotony, the repetition, the monotony. Where was I? Oh, yes. The repetition, the monotony. There's some good parodies, and even the occasional meta joke that breaks the fourth wall, or pokes fun at people who nitpick about consistency in fantasy worlds. And while I am a fan of such worlds, I just feel some more clearly set out rules for what can and cannot happen would help us. But having said all that, very rarely did I actually laugh. And I'm the type of weirdo who's easily amused and will laugh at something even when I'm watching it alone. Ha <laughs> ha! Every time I watch an episode of Futurama or The Simpsons, even the later seasons which we don't like to talk about, I find at least a few things to laugh at. But here, sometimes I would watch the majority of an episode and not even chuckle once. And that's because most of the jokes don't so much fall flat as violently faceplant. I found him! You did? Wait a minute. It's just three quarters of a dead raccoon. Me flavoured water, 15 cents! Come taste my knees! 15 cents! Not so fast. Three me's. Well, that's only two. One, two, me. Money's mine. Was that... was that a joke? Was that a joke? I don't even know anymore. Was that a joke? One problem is that many of the jokes are clearly telegraphed. As soon as they're set up, you know exactly what's coming. Don't panic. We can slip away unnoticed as long as everyone remains absolutely silent. What? This predictability is exacerbated by an over-reliance on what I'd call bait and switch, or yes, no, oh, alright then, jokes. When you expect something to happen and then it doesn't, and or when the contrast between the reaction to the expected thing and the subsequent deflation is what creates the humour. Here's a classic example from Monty Python. Brave, brave Concord! You shall not have died in vain! Uh, I'm, I'm not quite dead, sir. Well, you shall not have been mortally wounded in vain. I, I think I, I could pull through, sir. Oh, I see. Actually, I think I'm all right to come with you. No, sir. no, sweet Concord, stay here. Now imagine that, but way, way overdone, especially in the first half of the season. He's dead. Uh, I think I'm still alive. No, wait, never mind. God, you're selfish and cruel. Selfish, maybe, but cruel? Nah, also, maybe. But Zog never lets me go. He doesn't trust me because he thinks I'm just a dumb kid. That's so sad you never get to go. No, no, I, I go every year. He just never lets me. Hmm. You'd think that this formula would lend some unpredictability to the comedy. But no, because it occurs so often that it becomes predictable. It doesn't help that these gags are never pulled off with the skill and charisma that the Pythons employed. This also applies to the humour which is meant to be surreal and absurd. You know, very Python-esque. Sometimes it works. Now you've praised us too far. You must leave our humble home. Get out, Praiser. Thanks again. It was delicious. You're ruining our lives. But sometimes it doesn't. Take the racist antelope. An elf with a human girl? That ain't right. Pretty absurd, right? I guess it's supposed to be funny by being weird and shocking by having a cute animal being racist, but that in itself isn't funny. It would have been more awkward and shocking and therefore funny if the antelope had been racist directly to the characters. As it is, it feels like it's just thrown in randomly. These surreal jokes generally don't work because, unlike Monty Python, disenchantment isn't set up to be deliberately over the top and absurd. So those few times the humour tries to go down that road, it feels out of place with the rest of the show and doesn't really make sense. Look, I know it's a fucking cartoon we're talking about, but it's all about context and explanations. Other jokes also don't make sense, but for different reasons. I really don't like the view from down here. I love to sway and boots to the music. Why is there a solitary Scottish person in this fantasy kingdom? Was it just so they could make this joke? Yeah, that doesn't feel forced at all. Occasionally, the jokes ruin themselves with poor timing or over explanations. I guess the only bright side is... Now I got nothing left to lose. Uh, except the thing that says I'm a king! 
Yeah, come on! You see what I mean? There's lots of references and messages in the background, some of which were funny, but most of them just made me go, huh, that's kind of interesting. Puns abound, both in the background and as part of the dialogue. No, Mr. Elfo, I expect you to fry. This is one of the laziest forms of humour, and a lot of them were so bad that I frequently groaned loud enough for my neighbours to become a bit concerned. And some of these jokes are so terrible that they can be described without any reservation as dad jokes. I'm drowning! I'm Elfo! She's dying, you fucking psychopath! I know you're naive, but fuck me, you cannot not know what drowning is. And remember what I said earlier about the inclusion of drink and drugs? Well, Disenchantment commits that classic error, the same one that the Happy Time Murders and most Seth Rogen films do, thinking that having characters getting drunk or high and doing stupid shit is funny in and of itself. It isn't. You know when you go out to get plastered with your mates, cause a nuisance, steal traffic cones, and just generally have a good time? Well, it's only funny for you, not for anyone else watching. And that's what you'll be doing here watching cartoon characters getting shit-faced and tripping balls. That's not funny! If you're gonna do this stuff, do it maybe once? Not multiple times in the series! But the show relies on it more than a neckbeard on his mum's credit card. The imbibing of substances playing a prominent and sometimes crucial role in most episodes. It feels like they wrote most of the jokes while they were off their tits at the local opium den. Seriously, is this the best they could do? Finally, it's been pointed out by other reviewers that one of the episodes actually lifts a couple of jokes straight from an episode of Futurama. I don't know if there are any other examples of this, but it wouldn't surprise me, and it's indicative of the level of effort that was put into crafting the show. It's not just lazy. It's a schoolboy copying off Wikipedia and leaving in the hyperlinks lazy. It's Homer Simpson levels of lazy. Which is somewhat ironic, really. That's the thing about Disenchantment. It feels half-arsed, and it's neither a testament to Matt Groening's creative abilities, nor a worthy successor to the shows that preceded it and clearly inspired it. I'm fairly convinced that if that name and reputation hadn't been attached to this, few people would have cared about it. It's a comedy that's not that funny, and it's a story that's neither well-written or interesting enough to justify watching on its own merits. So it's not off to a great start, but the same thing has been said about Futurama. It needs to up its game in Season 2. But you know what? I think it will. I'm not holding my breath though. Thanks for watching folks. Let me know what you thought about Disenchantment and my video in the comments down below. I'm trying to improve my craft, so any constructive feedback is welcome. Just don't be a c Also, a big hello and thank you to everyone who subscribed since the plot holes video and contributed to the discussion there. Welcome aboard, and I hope you stick around for future videos. Next up is Sierra Burgess is a loser. It's gonna be an angry one, because I fucking hated it. So yeah, until then.